Well, my name is Jessica Downs. I am the children's pastor at East Ridge Church, and I am very honored to be with you guys here today. This is my first time ever leading a lab, so uh, slightly nervous, but that's all right. You know, having coffee on an empty stomach doesn't help with that either, but we'll be solid. Um, hey, I just want to let you guys know that um, my prayer for you guys is that as you walk out from this, that you can take something, whether it's one, two, three things that you can uh, take out of here and implement in your ministry. Uh, maybe it's just a shift of culture for you. Maybe student leaders hasn't been, having student leaders has been a, a main thing for you. But I hope that as you hear today, um, that that maybe shifts for you. So um, I'm going to lead us in prayer if that's all right. Father God, I thank you so much for the opportunity that I have here today to, to speak to this group of people. Father, I pray that everything that you have laid on my heart, I would be able to clearly communicate and uh, that we would all leave here today changed, not because of what I'm saying, but because uh, I'm your mouthpiece, God. I pray that everything that you want me to say and everything that you want these people to hear, God, uh, that I would be faithful to say those things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so... Um, I want a show of hands on how old you guys were when you felt a tug on your heart to go into to kids ministry, whether vocationally or just to, to volunteer. How many of you guys were 18 or older? Okay. How many of you guys were under 18? All right. About half and half, maybe slightly more under. Uh, for me, I was about 10 years old when I felt God laid on my heart to, to go into children's ministry. And um, as a 10-year-old, I, I, well, I always joke around about how I was a pastor's kid, so I don't know if that gives you any reference here, but uh, as soon as I was out of the nursery, I was serving in the nursery, which is only a slight exaggeration because it's pretty much true because, hello, free crackers, right? <laughs> and we had, we had four services, so what else was I going to do? Listen to my dad four times? Not so much. But I was 12 years old when um, I got the opportunity to lead a class for the first time, a preschool class. Now, this was at home back in Montana, small town. Everyone knew each other. So 12-year-old teacher, totally kosher. Nowadays, probably not so much. But um, I was given an opportunity, and I was given a platform to use the, the giftings and the heart that God had put in me. Um, and I want to challenge you guys today that there are students in your church that you can help give that platform to. Uh, I want you to think back, for those of you who were called, well, actually, no, at any age, if someone didn't give you the platform that you had to start ministry, where would you be? I probably wouldn't be the same place I am now. And just like um, Mark was talking about, oh, <laughs> like Mark was talking about in the main session, we have to give kids the opportunity to experiment because if we don't allow them to fail, we don't allow them to succeed. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, how the fact that I believe having student leaders in the ministry is the smartest thing that you can do, not only for your ministry or for them, but for your entire church. So why? <laughs> I think these, and this is where we're going to start with the, the fill-ins here. I believe that student leaders provide a different perspective, a perspective that I don't have. I'm only 27, but these, my youth leaders, they were in those seats not that long ago. They know what kids like. They know what's boring. They know they, they're more up to culture. They, um, they just have a different way of looking at things, a different way that we we need to embrace and we need to acknowledge. Uh, and by the way, for, this, for the purpose of this class, we're defining student leaders as uh, someone in your ministry that is still in either upper elementary, middle, or high school. So that's just for this room, that's not the technical you know, definition, but for us. Um, not only do they have the ability to relate to kids in a different way, but they also are maybe a little bit more innately creative. They've got crazy ideas. And for me, type A personality, creative, crazy ideas um, are a little stressful. <laughs> but at the same time, I need to be stretched in that. If I just did what I feel comfortable with in my ministry, it'd be a little boring. We need to allow for creativity. And maybe that's the kids in your ministry. Maybe that's your husband or your wife. But people need to... Um, at least I, 
I need to be able to look at that and, and pick out the, the, the nuggets, you know, the gold nuggets of, of wisdom in those things. Stretch myself a little bit. Um, so we can't always, we can't always do the same thing. You know, we, you can always go back and say, well, this is the way we've always done things. The fact is culture changes, kids change, things get boring. The, if, you, if you do things the way you've always done it, that only works for so long before it becomes ineffective. So thank you, Jace. Um, so I, that is, uh, that's another reason why they have a different perspective. If you guys didn't get a handout and would like one, they are right here. Um, so will their ideas be crazy? Yes, but I can guarantee you that they're gonna think of different things that you would never think of. And just a reminder, that is a good thing. <laughs> it can be stressful, but it's a good thing. The second thing is that kids love them. Kids look up to teenage leaders. They want to be them when they grow up. And you know what, if you're providing opportunities for teenagers to serve, they will be them when they grow up. And that's a really cool thing. The teenagers have a ton of energy it can be a lot of fun for the kids to play with. That's just a reality. Third thing is um, serving captures them early on. That's kind of a funny word to use, but I couldn't think of something that, that fits it better. It captures their hearts because let's just be honest, teenagers are leaving the church at a rapid, rapid rate. Whether they're in high school or as soon as they're out of high school, people are leaving the church. And if we give them an opportunity to belong and to grow in the church, they're gonna be way more likely to stay in the church. So, um, and in my mind, as long as they're not missing youth group, I say get them plugged in as early on as possible. If they're in fifth grade and they're still in your kids' ministry, give them leadership roles in your kids' ministry. If they're in sixth grade, I understand age restrictions, I get that. Sixth graders probably shouldn't be teaching fifth graders, but they can serve in the nursery or they can serve in preschool. Get them plugged in as soon as possible because if you don't, you can lose them, not just as a volunteer, but in the church as well. Um, serving, if serving is a part of their life in middle and high school, maybe even when they don't have a choice to come to church or not, serving is gonna be a part of their life when they're 30 and do have a choice. Um, the fourth one is that it shows them their higher purpose. And the reason I say show and not give is because we're not giving them a higher purpose. They already have a higher purpose, but we're helping them recognize that, that higher purpose in their lives. Um, they get to see how being involved gets, they get to see the greater purpose. They get to see the kingdom of God advancing. And for someone who, uh, adolescence is hard, let's just be honest. Someone who is struggling with their identity to know that you have a place in the kingdom of God is so valuable for them. Um, adolescents are, like I said, they're searching for identity. They're trying to find friends. They are longing to belong. And if we give them a place to serve in our ministry, it helps with all of those things. You're helping them, and the fifth thing is, you're helping them become better followers of Christ. If you've ever read the book Connect by Nelson Searcy, he, he mentions this, that when people serve, they become more like Jesus. You think back in the Bible, Jesus was the ultimate servant. He showed us what it means to sacrifice, what it means to serve, and he he told his disciples and he tells us to do those things as well. So when we, um, and this goes for recruiting all around, when we are inviting someone to be a part of our ministry, we're not just filling a, a gap. We are giving them the opportunity to become more like Christ. And let's just be honest, what higher purpose is there? You know? Um, okay, so we have talked about the why of why we should get teenagers involved. But let's talk a little bit about how. How do we get them involved? Because if you've ever worked with teenagers, and this is not a diss to any teenagers in the room, because I love ya, but working with teenagers can be difficult. What are some challenges that might come up in working with teenagers? Go ahead, shout it out. Not, have, not showing up. They don't have a ride. They don't have a ride, okay. <coughs> Inconsistency, stubbornness, huh? Sassy, Sassy. true conflicting schedules, 
on their cell phones or talking with friends in the back. Yeah. Wanting to do it their way. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they want to be in charge. These are all things, these are all challenges that come with working with teenagers and some adults too, which, you know, <laughs> depending on the person. Yeah. But I just want to encourage you guys that if we just look over those challenges and we just pass over our teenage volunteers, we are doing a disservice to them, to our ministry, to the kingdom of God. Because though it may be a little bit of or a lot of bit of work on the front end, the, the long-term benefits outweigh the short-term cost. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a challenge. And you're not going to see immediate re- rewards. You'll probably have to drill it into them and feel like you're like, okay, I know I've told you this like 10 times, but... <clears throat> But I just have to tell you that we get the opportunity to shape these young people. And that is uh, an opportunity that we shouldn't take lightly. So we have to be, it's not just going to happen on its own. We have to be intentional and we have to be strategic. So, sorry, I lost my place here. So the first one, the first E on the lines here is we must empower our student leaders. Each one of us had someone who believed in us to let us take the stage, to let us take the lead, whether it's vocationally children's ministry, vocational children's ministry, or whether it's volunteer. It doesn't matter. Someone believed in us enough to give us that spot. So why don't we believe enough to give someone else that spot? And I get it. I'm a type A personality. So giving over the reins, not knowing what it's going to look like or how it's going to turn out is hard. I get it. But you know what? God's word never returns void. So if you give these kids an opportunity and say, hey, here's the word of God and walk them through that, then then good is going to come out of it. I can guarantee you. So um, we need to be the same for our student leaders. We need to to be that person who believes in them. We need to let them have a voice at the table. We need to let them know that their opinions matter, that we're not just going to hear them and move on, but we are going to, to take those into account and weigh those and implement those. You know, we, we need to let them know um, that they are valued. We need to give them leadership roles. And we have to let them teach every once in a while. M- maybe it's just for a portion. Maybe it's just talking about offering. Or maybe it's talking about uh, the Bible verse for the day. Or, or maybe it's just, you know, a two-minute segment in the service. But we need to give them those opportunities. We need to give them space to learn and grow, just like Mark was talking about. Have you guys ever seen, like, the starter kits for, like, seedlings? They're like, they look like egg cartons. They've got little pieces of dirt in them. And the idea is that you plant a little seed in there and you put the lid on and it helps. It's kind of like a little greenhouse. It helps them grow. But what happens if you don't take those seedlings out of that tray? They die. They become root bound. They become restricted by where they are. If we don't take our kids and our leaders out of the place that they are and give them a greater responsibility, we are not allowing them to grow. We have to transfer them to to a greater responsibility. We need to give them space and grace to make mistakes. The second one um, is that we must equip them. So empowering our leaders is awesome. That's great. But if we don't equip them with the tools that they need to be successful, obviously we're setting them up to fail. We have to help them along in the process. And just like that seedling, um, we have to, at the beginning, we have to nurture them a little bit. We have to be careful. We have to, um, to pay attention to the environment and help them in those things. But once we set them, set them loose and, and transfer them into a greater leadership role, we need to equip them um, to know how else, where to go from there. Um, so here are a couple of things. Here's, I guess it's three things that we need to do in order to really equip our student leaders. The first one is communicate our expectations. You can't expect what you don't express. So having a clear and a concise document that says, hey, this is what we need of you. Because uh, how many of you guys have a handbook, a volunteer handbook? How many of you guys have a volunteer handbook that's about 50 pages long? 
some of us do. We can't expect our teenagers to read that. We don't even read it. At least I don't. 50 pages, not going to happen. We need to be clear and concise about what our expectations are. The second one is that we need to give them what they need to do a good job. So that means we have to be on the ball and we have to get them our materials, their materials ahead of time so that they have time to prepare. They didn't go to school for this. They can't just whip something up off the top of their head like sometimes we do, not that we should, but sometimes we do. We need to give them the opportunities, uh, but not just the opportunities, we need to give them the materials to succeed. Um, and I, I wanna say from the beginning, <laughs> I guess rewind a little bit, all of this that I'm talking about is something that God has put on my heart and I'm passionate about, but I have not successfully implemented all of these things. And I have someone in my group right here, so I wanted to make sure and let you guys know because as much as I believe every th single thing that I'm saying here, it takes time and it takes energy. So what I'm saying, I'm preaching to myself here too, so just throw that out there. Um, so offer your assistance to these teenagers. If, you know, give them the materials and say, hey, if you want to talk, let's go to coffee. If you have any questions, I am totally 100% here to, to bounce any ideas off of. Or if you have any questions, um, you are not alone in this. Make sure that they know that. And then uh, provide the props and the tools that are necessary. Uh, giving them a sheet of paper with the curriculum and a big old long list of things that you need for the illustrations, that's not going to work because they might not have a car to go buy all those things. They may not have the money to go buy all those things. And as a leader, really, honestly, we need to prep those things ahead of time, especially if they're a new, new leader. Um, the third thing is that we need to train them. Whether it's an annual, semi-annual, quarterly, monthly meeting, we need to do it. And I know that that's hard, but uh, at, our, at our church at Eastridge, we have been doing a yearly training. Now, that's great because we could be doing nothing, but think about it. We've got a once a year training that we're expecting all of our volunteers to be at, that we are jamming everything that they need to know in one session, and we're expecting them to remember it all. Is that gonna work? No, no, it's not. So one thing that we're doing, uh, and I got the idea from a fellow children's pastor in Florida, we are moving to monthly meetings, which going from a yearly meeting to a monthly meeting is a big jump. I get that. But one thing, or a couple of things that he mentioned to me is that it builds unity in your team. It helps you communicate clearly what you need on a regular basis. Because let's think, if you have someone coming in in February that wants to be a new volunteer, okay, just wait till September till we have our, our yearly training or throw them in but then they don't really get to learn how to do it until September. It's, it's kind of a recipe for disaster. So it builds unity, it clarifies things, and instead of focusing on everything all at once, you can focus on one or two topics at a time. You can talk about more things than you could talk about in your once a year training. You can talk about special needs in your ministry or in your classroom. You can talk about uh, missions and how to impart a missions-oriented heart into a child. There's just so much more that you can do when you meet with your team more often. Yeah. Can I ask you, when do you do those? Uh, so she, What's good for you guys? she was asking, when do we do those meetings? We, uh, we're starting in January, so it's not something that we've implemented yet, but we're going to do, um, every month we're uh, going, like one month doing Alternating, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> one Sunday and then the Thursday the next week, and then, or next month, then a Sunday, then a Thursday. So we do it in the evenings, we're calling it team nights. And um, the cool part is, is that I'm not just talking at them. We're doing a team building activity, we're gonna have food, we're gonna, be, we're gonna have fun. And there's only gonna be about 20 minutes of it that's actually training. Because no one's gonna wanna come to it if you're just talking at them the whole time. So this is an opportunity to, to like, like he was saying, build team unity and build, um, just encourage them, really. And it's a great time to, to uh, give out awards to your team members that have gone above and beyond. So we, um, I'll let you know how it goes, <laughs> but, uh, but we're doing the Sunday and the Thursday because they Paula. seem to be, to, thank you, Paula will come to mind. Um, they seem to be good days for people. Is yeah. For your team members only or yes, everybody? it's all of my volunteers. That's a good question. If they don't show up, um, we do not reprimand them, but we are heavily encouraging it because, um, and I think a lot of it comes on the communication on the front end of why are we doing this and how this is gonna be benefit you as a leader. 
uh, and I know that it's a big time commitment. I get that. But if we get them to come to six out of 12 trainings, it's better than missing the once yearly training, right? Did you have a question? And this is like nursery, nursery, nursery through fifth grade. Yeah, and there are going to be some where we'll probably break into different groups where um, maybe one month it'll just be the nursery people or maybe we'll, we'll all meet at the same time but doing maybe different areas. Maybe the elementary volunteers will go ice skating or rollerblading or rollerblading. <laughs> Who does that anymore, right? Rollerblading? I don't know. They do, they do. Um, so that's a good question. Uh, so it really just depends on what you think works best for your, for your team. And maybe monthly doesn't resonate well with you. That's totally fine. But I, encur I would encourage you to take a long, hard look at it. Is, are your meetings accomplishing the things that you need them to? So, um, so for me, our monthly trainings are going to be, or we're team nights, because we don't want to call them trainings because people get scared of training, right? right. And the people that, are, um, that have been doing it for a long time think, I don't need to be trained. I know what I'm doing. So that's why we're going to call it a team night. So um, we're going to have it be an hour. There's always going to be food. There's always going to be fun. And um, you, yeah, always have food, people. Always have food. No one's going to want to come if you don't have food. Door prizes. Door prizes. <laughs> exactly. If you show, your name is in a raffle. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so the, I guess the third thing, the third E, is that we must encourage them. And this is huge. Affirmation is a basic human need. We all have it. Have you guys ever met someone who doesn't want to be encouraged? Now, you might have met someone who gets embarrassed, but I can tell you deep down they appreciate the encouragement. We, it's, it's innate in all of us. We need it. And let's just be honest, they don't have to be there. They're your volunteers. You know what I mean? We cannot take advantage of them because they do not have to show up. They're doing it out of the kindness of their heart, maybe a little bit of guilt tripping on our part, right? But um, we need to make sure that they know how much we value them. And it's not, it's not just a, you know, once a year, hey, here's your Christmas present, thanks for being a part of the team. It's an ongoing thing. Um, student leaders, they need your encouragement probably more than any of your other volunteers because of the stage of life that they're in. Like, like we were talking about before, they're trying to find their identity. They're trying to figure out who they are and who they're going to be. So this is, this is a fragile, this is a, a really important time in their life. And if we, as children's leaders, can come alongside them and say, you are doing an amazing job. We appreciate you. Everything that you had just said to that kid, that, that just built up that kid so much. When we encourage them, we are helping them, like we were talking about before, become the person that God wants them to be. So it is it's super important. They're, they're going through this really difficult time. And let's just be honest, not all of those teenagers have a good home life. At church, we might be the only people who are speaking positive words over them. So we need to carry that with weight. We need to recognize how important that is. So we need to also build a relationship with our team. So maybe that means... Um, going out for coffee. Maybe that means having a board game night. Maybe that means uh, whatever that looks like in your, uh, in your position or in your capacity. Um, but we need to, to build a relationship. Find out when their birthday is. Send them a card. Not only, don't only send them a card, but find out what their favorite candy bar is. Do you know that candy bars, it's like a buck. But I have all the, I, all the time I have people say, how do you remember what my favorite candy was? I'm like, oh, remember that one time at the very beginning when I first came and I asked you what your favorite candy bar was? That's where I got it from. I don't say that, but I'm like, oh, well, you know, pretty cool like that. Um, I have a document, literally. I have a document on my, it is, yeah, it is on a document on my computer. These are the birthdays in January, or these are the anniversaries in January. Can I just tell you, sending an anniversary card to, to your team members, that goes above and beyond because they don't, most people don't recognize that, but it's an important thing. Um, and... Uh, I got this idea from a previous conference that I went to. Uh, the speaker was, I don't even remember what her topic was, but she talked about sending cards each week. Now, this isn't sending cards to all of your volunteers because maybe it is for you guys, but we got like 120 volunteers each week. I can't do that. But picking each department, we've got an elementary, preschool, and a nursery, each department sending three cards each week that just say, hey, I noticed how you talked to this one kid when he was having a really hard time. Be specific, encourage them, and let them know how much you appreciated it. Not only will you build them up, 
but it helps you as a leader look for the good. I think a lot of times as leaders, we, we see what goes bad and we try to fix that, but we also need to be on the lookout for what has gone well. And honestly, for some of those volunteers, you're gonna have to look pretty hard, <laughs> right? You are. You look nice. Yeah, yeah. You have to, you have to search for it. And I have, I have another document on my computer that says, on this date I sent so-and-so a card so that I know, oh, this person hasn't gotten one in a while. Or I just sent one to this person two weeks ago, so I'll maybe hold off on that. It helps me know that I am recognizing my whole team, not just the few and far between that are awesome. You know what I mean? Um, so that is super important. Um, once you've built relationship with your team, then you have, you're allowed to bring constructive criticism. When you are not encouraging and uplifting your team, they're not gonna take criticism well. But when they know that you truly love them and care about them, they're going to know that you're coming from a place of that, of your concern for them. So have you guys ever heard the sandwich method? when you're bringing uh, criticism, you start with a, a positive, then you kind of bring the little bit of constructive criticism and then you end with a positive. It helps, some people don't go by that, but I think most people that don't go by that are like more in the business world. But I think it's, I think it's really important because if someone just comes up to you and says, you know, when you did that in small group, I don't think that was smart. You should have done something else. But when they say, hey, oh, okay, so here's an example our boys' small groups on Sunday morning. They get done really quickly. We have like 15 minutes for small group time. The girls are like talking, chatting for the whole 15 minutes. Boys are like, boom, we're done. So encouraging them and saying, hey, I'll just use one of our small group leaders. David, I saw how you really truly were interested in what these kids' weeks look like. That's awesome. I really appreciate that. Hey, I have a suggestion for you. Why don't you, instead of just reading the question, maybe expand on it a little bit? Or if you get a one-word answer from a kid, say, well, what do you mean? And then follow it up with another positive. And that's going to be taken a lot better than just uh, speaking out of the, the just, just pointing out the negative. Um, so that's something I think probably all of us recognize and all of us are aware of. But just a reminder that it is never good to just point off, out the negative. And I understand that sometimes it's coming from a heated emotional spot, but you got to dig deep, dig deep and find that positive thing. Um, no one wants to be land blasted for something that they're volunteering to do. Let's just be honest. No one wants to get that from you. They'll just walk out. You got, you have to come from a place of caring for them. Um, so empowering, equipping and encouraging our team. This can go across the board. This doesn't just have to be for teen leaders. But I recognize the fact that teen leaders, it's a little bit of a challenge. But you're not just investing in your ministry. You're investing in their lives. You're helping them figure out what God wants for them. And can I just tell you that God wants for them to be a part of the body of Christ. Whether it's vocationally or not, it doesn't matter. We all have a body, a part in the body of Christ. We talk about it all the time. First Corinthians, part of the body. Some might be an ear, some might be a toe. Some might, I always talk about when I'm talking to kids about this, look at your pinky toe. Look how small it is compared to the rest of your body. But if we chopped off our pinky toe, we wouldn't be able to walk. Each part is an integral part of the body of Christ. And I think all too often, sometimes we forget about that with teenagers because it's a challenge. But it, it is, they have... They have a huge part in the body of Christ. And if we are not encouraging them to fill, to fulfill that part that God has for them, we are stifling their growth. And we're stifling our growth and our church and our ministry. So I just want to encourage you guys today, whatever that means for your ministry, if you guys have, how many of you guys have teenage volunteers in your ministry right now? That's awesome. That's awesome. I think that was pretty much everyone. If you don't, you should. And if you do, I just want to encourage you guys, keep fighting. Sometimes it feels like a fight. I get that. But I want, I want you guys to know that what you're doing is so much more than just giving someone a one-minute slot to do the, the memory verse. What you're doing is investing in the kingdom and these, the students' lives. So...
Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Uh, we've got some time questions, conversation. I'd love to hear what you guys are doing to, to build up your people. Yeah. Yeah, so Paula was asking, where do we recruit youth? Do we go to youth youth church? Honestly, it kind of, at least for the, in my current position, like Mark was talking about, they're willing. They'll step up and say, hey, how can I help? But I think if you've got a good relationship with your youth pastor and you've got a, an understanding that you're not trying to steal people away, you're not taking them from youth group to, to serve, but you, but you work together, that your youth group, leader, your pastor can say, hey, I've got this list of, of teenagers that would do an awesome job. Or maybe even, hey, here's a student that's really struggling. I think if we got them plugged in, that would help them in their walk with God. So to answer your question, I think some of it's organic. It'll just happen. And your teenagers that you have in your ministry right now, if you take care of them and love on them, they're going to spread the word. They're going to tell their friends to come join them. So that's a good question. Did you have a question? Sure. That's a good question. Uh, she was asking about fourth and fifth graders. Do we have a separate track or do we include them in this whole thing? Um, I think for fourth and fifth graders, you do include them in this. But I think that there is kind of a, a separate a separate track because um, for me, my fourth and fifth graders, they are a part of my kids' ministry. They're a part of my elementary ministry. So I don't necessarily want them to to leave and go serve in the nursery during the time where they're supposed to be in church. So for me, I think providing them an opportunity to serve within the elementary ministry, whether that means a team leader, the person that hands out Bible bucks, the Bible bucks store, uh, you know, merchant, or the soundboard. I've got sound, I've got, I've got fifth graders doing my sound and my media. Takes a little bit of time to train them, but really pro presenter, click, yeah. click. It's really not that difficult. And can I just tell you that I have gotten fifth graders back in to kids ministry because they are in a leadership role because i think all too often our fifth graders uh, unless we're super intentional and i'm trying to get better about that unless we're super intentional about going for the fifth grade boy i don't know if you guys remember kevin gear that was like his mantra aim for the fifth grade boy and everyone else will come along but i think a lot of times fifth graders and even fourth graders sometimes feel like kids ministry is just too kiddish for them but when you challenge them and say hey caleb could you help me out? Could you be a leader in this area? This is what you're gonna do and tell them what to do. They're gonna step up. Even some of your troublemakers, actually, especially some of your troublemakers, if they're having a hard time paying attention, give them a leadership role. They'll totally step up. Because a lot of times it's just that feeling of, well, I've already heard this story, I'm bored. But when you say, hey, kids are watching you. Could you do this for me and be a leader? They're going to step up right away. So that's a good question. And actually, what I've thought about starting is a kind of a leadership track for fourth and fifth graders uh, of kind of doing a devotional with them and um, really raising them up and teaching them more than just click, 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 but teaching them what it means to be a servant. Uh, and that's something that is on my, my to-do list. It's on my, my goals, even for 2016, of I want to start that because I believe in it. And, That's a good question. Probably, my guess is probably Sunday after service. Bring food because they're already there. All the parents have to do is come back and, and pick them up afterwards. You could do it on a totally different night. doesn't really matter. And you might have to try a couple different options. But I think for us, we typically get a better turnout when it's just right after service with lunch. Do you have a question? Yeah. And we were trying to make it go to the uh, media break, which is May 4th, that so it's the um, um, 8th. Yeah. And that was just on Thursday. And then um, if you have to stay two or three services, then they have to go back to church right after service. Yeah. And we were trying to make it. Yeah, she was talking about, she was talking about having them lead worship or, um, or I'm sorry, I was totally listening and I just thought, greeting. greeting. That's, a, that's a huge thing. Greeting, having, having the kids as they come in, have someone there be like, hey, thanks for coming to Kid Zone, which is our name. But um, I'm so excited to have you here. Helping them in, in having a place to serve because I think it's easy to give them a, a, a busy, busy work job that they're willing to do, like prepping small group bins. I have my fifth graders do that, my fourth and fifth graders. But giving them something that has even greater purpose, and she was talking about 
meeting with them, having them bring their lunch, go over a scripture together, uh, and dig deep. I think that's awesome. If you were a teacher, a special t-shirt. Ooh, special t-shirt. Woohoo! You have graduated. You are in our leadership track. You get a t-shirt. They'd love that. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know, I just, you know, it's a big thing for yeah. us as a family. Um, and then one day she was like, Mom, why can't I volunteer? Hmm. And I said, oh, maybe like talk to different churches where you can probably volunteer now. Yeah. And so she talked to two churches who volunteer on like the next week. And they love she, it. She loved it. Yeah. So it was one of those things of as a parent, you know, already communicating it to your kids that if you're volunteering, it's okay for them to volunteer too. Yeah, totally. Um, Yeah, totally. She, she, yeah, multiple services. Yeah, she was talking about how she's got an 11 year old daughter and her daughter brought up, hey, when can I serve? And as soon as she got plugged in, she loved it. And, and it's great. And honestly, if you get the 11, 11 year olds to serve, sometimes you can get the parents to serve too. So it can go the other way around. Any other questions, comments? No? Five minutes to spare, guys. Boom. All right, can I pray over you guys? Father, I thank you so much for this group. Lord, I pray that as they go today and go throughout the rest of this weekend, Lord, that they would be refreshed and encouraged and that they would just hear a word from you, God, that that whatever you want them to walk away with, God, that you would impart that in their hearts. And Lord, not not only that you would imparted on their hearts now, but even when they go home, that they would put things into action. I know conferences can be kind of a drink from a fire hose, but Lord, I pray that you'd help them to to pick out the, the little things that they can implement now. I pray that you'd be with us in the rest of Fusion. Help everything to run smoothly. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. You guys are awesome. Thank you.